American business has been both in principle and in practice enthusiastically committed both to diversity and to the immigration that has produced it and has done well by them both. Legal immigration to the US since 1970 has amounted to about 34 million people. And in the same period, <clears throat> in the same period, the US economy has grown from around one trillion to around 14 trillion dollars. So all that immigration, huge growth in the economy. But of course, the other thing that's grown in the US since 1970 has, as everyone knows, been income inequality. Today, the proportion of income going to the top 10% of earners has matched and sometimes exceeded the previous highs from the 1920s, which might not be a problem if the traditional justification for such equalities that a smaller share of a large pie is worth more than a larger share of a small pie could plausibly be invoked. After all, you are indeed better off if you have 2% of $1,000 than if you have 10% of 100. But that argument has been pretty much irrelevant for over 40 years. Why? Because the pie has been getting bigger, but not even the tiniest slice of its growth has been eaten by the vast majority of Americans. Since 1969, virtually all the growth in the American income has gone to the richest 10% of the population. None of it has gone to the rest of us. And for the last 30 years, the wealth of the bottom 80% has not only declined in proportion, it has declined absolutely. Um, this is a little hard to read, but I'll summarize it. In 1983, the average net worth of the bottom 80% was $65,300. This is in constant $2,009. In 2009, it was 62,900. So the bottom 80% was worth less in real numbers in, 80, in 2009 than it was in 83. Meanwhile, the average net worth of the top 20% went from 1,137,000 to 1,711,500. And of course, I don't have a chart for this, but things have not gotten more equal since 2009, just the opposite. In 2010, 93% of the additional income created in the US went not to the top 20, or even to the top 10, but to the top 1% of the population. So the pie has indeed gotten larger, but the pieces actually going to most of the population have gotten smaller. In the US then, the liberal commitment to diversity has not produced, and indeed has nothing to do with greater equality. In fact, the whole point of the commitment to diversity and this is true in England and in France, I think, as well as in the US, is to strive for a kind of illusion of equality. Not a world in which there is less difference between the rich and the poor, but a world in which the rich come in a wider range of colors, black and yellow, as well as white. There is, in other words, nothing egalitarian about the commitment to multiculturalism. But there's nothing egalitarian about the opposition to it either. Rather, the whole interest in the question of identity, national or ethnic, single or multiple, is, I argue, a way of managing rather than seeking to minimize inequality. To produce equality between the classes, you have to distribute wealth. But if you can convince people that their identity matters more than their class, you can keep your money in your pocket and just acknowledge the beauty of their literature. Cultural equality, in other words, is equality on the cheap. The insistence on choice is just a facade. But I myself think that the real problem with the new notions of identity is not what might be old about them, what some might call their racist anti-liberalism, but precisely what's new about them, the prominence of choice, and hence not their anti-liberalism, but their liberalism. For nothing is more definitive of liberalism today than its commitment to the idea that our position in society is essentially a matter of choice, that success is a function of making good choices and failure a consequence of making bad ones. In this view, the question of your social class goes from being something like your grandfather, you can't change it, to what Bart de Wever calls a choice. You can if you work, just work hard enough. And of course, it's true that sometimes you can. 
But it's also true that much more often you can't. Social mobility in the US is low both absolutely and relatively. That is, and I'm not quoting some left-wing periodical here, I'm quoting Forbes, which is the uh, magazine of the filthy rich. 42% of children born to parents in the bottom fifth of the income distribution remain in the bottom, while 39% born to parents in the top fifth remain at the top. That I, who had many doubts about multiculturalism, was kind of reconsidering multiculturalism just because I wanted to contradict him. And not only because I wanted to contradict a book that I read, but I thought maybe multiculturalism deserves better than that. Is multiculturalism indeed the, in such a total opposition to equality? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, secondly, uh, I won't buy his attacks on the identity concept. And third, I won't buy the correlation between race and culture or his theory that the one is just a substitute for the other. Culture is just another word in those theories, also for some anthropologists in Ghent, for instance, and some um, pupils of, for instance, uh, Rick Pinkston, uh, will call culture a kind of uh, following up of that kind of race, just another word for racism. I won't buy that. My critique about classes, when you read this, this wonderful book, which is so um, allure, alluring in a way, you almost believe him, that when you read it, almost, almost. Yes, and then I'm saved. And then I think the only thing he will allow for is classes. That's the thing which really exists. It does exist. It is there. No races, of course. America is full of racism, but there are no races. This I have learned from him. There are no races, languages, they are all equal. Of course they are equal. There are no better languages. Nobody will pretend this. But there are no races, no languages, no cultures, no religions, and each of them, each of these categories is dealt with in another way. And all of these categories, race, language, culture, religion, are in fact obscuring misnomers which he ridicules. But they won't disappear because an American essayist and philosopher ridicules them, I, I'm afraid. We have moved since the early 90s from an ethnic minorities paradigm, which was a welfare state paradigm, or at least it followed the blueprints of the welfare state. It was collective, it had to do with specific interest groups. All right, all the way now to a, an entirely new paradigm, which is uh, 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 uniquely dominated by uh, labor market concerns. All right? So at the moment, we only have a view on society uh, which is based on notions like employability. All right. <laughs> now, very quickly sketching this. In the, in the early 90s, uh, as you know, here in this country, we got our first sort of diversity politics. It was called integration policies. Right? And inequality as a structural feature of society was already eliminated at that moment. It was no longer an ingredient of the debate on the structure of society in terms of diversity, social cultural diversity. So the system was all already clean of, of, of inequality. At that moment, we already had basically two debates, one on inequality and another one on diversity. Now, what about you know, this diversity? Well, this diversity was basically addressed by means of two notions. On the one hand, there was a notion of openness, cultural tolerance, etc., etc. You're all familiar with that, on the one hand. On the, other one, on the other hand, you had the notion of equal opportunity, and that was notably a social democratic notion. Now, equal opportunity in actual reality, it's still used in actual reality, it meant we, are going, we will always use the same standards for uh, basically everyone in society, all right? And when we do that, we will have an entirely fair and an entirely just society. And in that sense, it's, uh, well, essentially a sort of uh, uh, fake enlightenment uh, argument, all right? Equ equality for all. Everyone is equal, so all right, we're going to treat ev everyone by means of the same standard. But of course, the standard was essentially 
the, the way of life of the white middle class. And I know this is heavily contested, but here are the facts, right? And the very clearest of area in, in which you can see that is in the domain of uh, education policies. I, I could go on uh, about that forever. But interesting, uh, the interesting thing, of course, was that the structural handicaps of certain groups, you know, the structural deficits, and not just of minorities, but also, for instance, of women or of individuals with, uh, let's say, disabilities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, were hocus-pocused away. Equal opportunity, one standard for everyone. And sorry if you're below there, all right? Bad luck for you. Eh? Work harder, all right? That was the way in which it was handled, in, let's say, the 90s, then at the beginning of the, of, of, of the 21st century. We get a new paradigm, and, uh, and effectively, let's say, since, since uh, 2008, it is the only paradigm we have, and that's an, an absolute individualization of society, all right? Everything that we used to label with, uh, you know, issues of diversity or, or inequality is now an... an uh, an issue of individual employability, right? And again, of course, the structural handicaps, the structural, let's say, deficiencies or, or let's say, deficits of certain groups are, again, invisible. They're not there, all right? Secondly, of course, what you see is an enormous escalation of moral discourses, moralizations, all right? Well, you're poor, bad luck. You have to have the right values, you know. You have to work hard. You have to be more resilient. We're going to train you, all right? We're going to give you an individual mentor, all right, to, to build your strengths, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to make you employable, but you yourself have to do the work, eh? And it is at that moment, you know, that you see the whole notion of behavior. Behave before you want work, all right? Behave if you want to be equal, all right? And also the will to integrate, the will to be like us. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we have heard um, um, references to the waiver here. Eh? The will to integrate, you need to have the will to do this and that and that. So an entirely new set of discourses that are entirely individual and entirely moral, and it all boils down to, well, if you want something in society, you need to deserve it.